All right, so now we're going to talk about some of the uh, basics of studio and acoustic treatments. And uh, I know, like myself, uh, a lot of you are operating home-based studios and um, may not have had much experience with doing proper acoustic treatment before. So let's assume we're starting from nothing and uh, Peter uh, graciously has offered his time to bring us up to speed. So uh, Peter, assuming that uh, we're starting from a, a background of basically no education in this, what, what do we need to know about um, acoustic treatment? Well, the first thing, we always laugh, we tell people, look, throw a bunch of fuzzy cats or dead cats on the wall, you'll start solving problems. Uh, acoustics are a lot easier than people realize. We are not going to build a million dollar recording studio by putting a thousand dollars or five hundred dollars worth of stuff on the wall. It ain't gonna happen. Get past it. What you first gotta understand is where are your main problems, what can you do, and what you can't do. Number one, if you've got a train going by your house all day, all night, and you want to know what to do, the easiest solution is move. <laughs> Don't try to fix it. Don't try to move the train. Move to another place because you can't stop that kind of noise. You know, the, the, the other thing is, remember, you're going to pick the low fruit from the tree. You don't want to be trying to do things that just are too difficult to deal with. Bass is hard to deal with. Mids and high frequencies are easy to deal with. So always think in terms of what's easiest first, okay? And that's really, it has to do with the amount of energy. If you take a look at a curve, and I'll draw one up very quickly here. If you take a look at, at a bass curve, and then if you look at a high frequency curve at the same amplitude, you notice that the bass has got all that space. Look at that bass, it's got all that. That's, that's energy, that's energy. This would be the high frequencies. So you can see here, there's mids, let's say. You can see there's a lot less energy. That's the hint. The hint is energy is in the base. High frequencies, less energy, easy to manage. So what would you do? First thing, and I've drawn up a basic recording studio setup, so a typical room. Where's the easy stuff? So let's deal with the easy stuff first. First thing is, you've got your sound, what we call the direct sound from your monitors. That's easy. That's what you want to hear. The problem is that those monitors are also sending energy across this way. So as that happens, if we kind of draw that up on a quick little chart here, there's the sound you want. And a few seconds later, milliseconds later, that's coming in. And that's that reflected sound. So what we really want to try to do is solve the problem by getting some acoustic panels into the zones where you get your primary reflections. So the worst offender is usually side to side. That's number one. Number two is going to be front to back. So same deal. You want to look at treating this end of the room. So those are, you know, if I was going to say, what do I do first? There's A, B, and C. The first thing. Next thing, in a rectangular room like this, you have something called a standing wave. And what that means is it's a low frequency that moves back and forth, and it can be multiples of that frequency. Clap your hands in your room and you'll hear a bunch of trailing echo, bring, as it does that. Well, you get that ricochet happening. Well, what's really happening there is that that energy is going back and forth like that, right? It's going back and forth in your room. So ultimately, the other thing we wanna to try to do is try to minimize that. So we'll strategically position panels so that, you know, I might have some here, some here, then I've got a panel back in here. So what happens is that I'm kind of minimizing those ricochet echoes so they aren't all over the place. They're a little easier to, to tame. That's really, you know, that, that right there, you're probably 75% on your way. That's, that's really how simple it is. It's getting rid of those primary reflections, understanding how they work, and, and that's kind of the deal. The next thing is, and I've mentioned this in the past, is that you also have to think in terms of balance. You want to position yourself in, a, in an area, if you can, where you have good left-right balance. Uh, think about it. If you, if you have a window to your left and an acoustically treated wall to your right, your mix is going to be weird because you've got all that reflection from that very hard surface. So you want to look at your room and figure out the positioning so you don't get all that kind of, you know, stuff happening on one side where it's not happening on the other. So it's really getting that mix nice. Um, the other thing is, is not only you want to balance it 
acoustically as far as your positioning, but frequency balance too. And I've shown that over here. Um, as the panel gets thicker, the lower frequency it absorbs. So ultimately, you want to try to look at how these things work. Uh, um, foam, for example, uh, like a one inch foam can sometimes be the worst thing you put in a room because it will only absorb very high frequencies. So you get all these mid-range prevalent and low mids prevalent. And that's a big problem, particularly in vo vocal boost. People hear it, they call it chest hump. It's a low frequency buildup. Because what's happening is they're, they're absorbing the highs, but they're not treating the lows. So as you get into a deeper material and thicker, more dense material, you get lower and lower frequency. This thing here, this, this graph is called the absorption coefficient. It's really easy. One means 100% absorption. Nine means 90%. I don't know why they don't just use 100%. I, you know, it was done well before our time, but that's what they do. So you just look at that, and just like a microphone, you want as flat of a frequency response as possible. You might put some one inch, some two inch, and some three inch um, prime acoustic Broadway panels, for example, in your room, and that'll give you at least some balanced absorption. That's boy, you're, you're, that's eighty five percent there in in designing a room. Fantastic. So so what I've heard so far are the the thicker the material you're using is the better. Now, if you go and do something like the the bass traps that you guys produce, that are very thick. Um, do they sacrifice at all absorption in the high end, or are they just basically best all around? Well, you've got a couple things going on there. Number one, I say thicker, but also look at the density. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you can have very thick glass, but it reflects all the energy. So it comes down to getting that right mix of density. We use a six-pound glass wool because that has the best absorption in the low frequencies without sacrificing high-frequency absorption. Uh, okay. On our base trap, we have a couple different models to choose from. And with base traps, with, like with any rigid type panel, so not hard, but rigid as being something that, that isn't like um, just like a really soft foam, you can actually have an airspace behind it, and that airspace actually uh, will help absorb low frequencies. You can go even further looking into something like the Max Trap that uses a diaphragmatic resonator. So as you get used to your studio, and I think this is something that, that I, I don't know if people realize, but start by getting some treatment up there. Listen to your room. Start working with your room. Listen to your mixes. Go into your car. Go over to your friend's house. Listen to it on an AM radio. Try your mixes on different, um, uh, you know, different speakers and in different rooms. And you'll hear how your speakers work. Once you get used to your room, your production will get better. And then as you become more aware, you're going to start adding tools to improve your room. Like you'll add more advanced bass traps or you might add ceiling clouds. These are the kinds of things that people normally add over time. Okay. Fantastic. And one thing you touched on there as well was glass. And I know uh, a lot of people have at least a window. Uh, sometimes if you're, you're in a condo in a downtown area, those things are all glass. Um, I've heard, and this may or may not be right, but glass is pretty bad to have in a studio because it reflects a lot of sound. Is that right at all? Or? Well, it is. So again, you know, when I talked about uh, laying out your room, uh, if, if you have glass, try to think of it in terms of balance. So if you've got glass, make sure that that glass is kind of balanced as best you can. You can't make it perfect. The other thing that sometimes people will do is that if they've got this huge glass window, let's say right here, okay, and then what happens is that, you know, it's a problem. A good trick is you get some theater drape, some very heavy velour drape, and what you do is you bring it out across that window when you're mixing, when you're working. So open it up while you're writing your songs because you want that creative look outside, you know, you want to see all that stuff wherever, you know, you might have a great view of whatever. Um, and then you can always move, put some movable acoustics in there when you're doing more critical mixing. That's a nice way to, to, to solve the problem. Uh, there are no perfect rooms except for a fully designed recording studio. They certainly have their place, but I think more and more people want to work from home. That's certainly all the pros, and we've supplied studio equipment to the best in the business, and that's what people are doing. They're building out of their home, and they're getting really good results. So just a bit of knowledge can get you a long way. Fantastic. Thanks, Peter. Um, anything else that we should um, look at in, in these diagrams here? Any other you know, basic level knowledge that uh, you think would be valuable to bring us up to speed? I think there's a whole bunch of extra things that you can put in your, 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 um, your little studio that you don't realize will actually help you acoustically. A, a big couch will work like a help a lot. If you've got no budget, I saw a friend of mine just went and bought a big chunk of uh, fiberglass, you know, one of those big bales of fiberglass, left it 
you know, inside the package and put a blanket over it. It doesn't look very good, but it sucked out a lot of the base. Um, the other thing is that uh, something like a bookcase, uh, strategically positioned behind you, for example, could help um, absorb energy and diffuse some energy. So, you know, you can use some makeshift things and get pretty good results. Uh, our product really is designed to look more attractive. It doesn't look makeshift, doesn't look homemade. And, and there's nothing wrong with homemade solutions. Uh, but, you know, it depends on if you're going to bring clients in or if you, you know, you're that kind of a person that wants something a little slicker. That tends to be uh, the reason you want to go to a manufactured product. It just looks a little more professional. And also, like you were saying earlier, like, um, you know, before talking to you, I might have thought, well, hey, you know, putting up foam is a good idea, even if it's any type of foam. But from what you've just showed me up here, how foam is uh, okay at absorbing the higher frequencies, but doesn't do as good of a job in the mid and base range, that could actually really, correct me if I'm wrong, but distort your mix. Well, that's the problem. And, and, and that is what we found out. Remember, acoustics uh, back in the 80s, even in the 90s, was only uh, there's, there's this, this you know, magical science that nobody knew about. And then with the computers, we started to look at room modeling and we started to actually measure things and say, wow, I mean, that's not really helping, is it? No, it's causing problems. And then all of a sudden, engineers would come in and say, well, why am I getting this problem? Why do I have to do all this radical EQ after I've put all this, this foam in my room? Foam certainly has its place. It can be low cost and it can help. But truth be known, you really want to get that density a lot higher because, the, you know, it really comes down to absorbing even, you know, even frequencies. Mm -hmm. um, it's not hard. It's really not hard at all. Uh, you'll just, you know, a good panel uh, by a good manufacturer will have spe uh, specifications that have been tested. It's the other thing. You want to see it, real tests done by Riverbank Labs or someone like that so that you actually see tests, not just some claims. There's a lot of people building stuff out there and they aren't really testing the materials. Um, and finding one little note too, just keep in mind that if you are in a high rise, uh, a lot of cities like I'm sure Vancouver or New York or whatever, you've got to be aware that, you know, when you permanently glue stuff to a wall, you're actually then into what they call a construction code. You might want to make sure that that the product that you're putting up on your wall is class A rated for, for what they call fire and smoke. Um, again, that's to make sure that you're safe. You know, if you don't smoke in your house and you're not worried about it, go right ahead. But, if, you know, as a manufacturer, we have to be very careful. We have to make sure our products meet those requirements so that if a school wants to put, you know, stuff into, uh, you know, put some of our, our prime acoustic panels into their school, it has to pass fire tests. So that's mm, just another important. thing. You know, insurance companies, probably will turn a blind eye to that kind of a thing in a home. But, you know, we have to say that so that you understand our legal liability. Yeah, great. And we'll get into as well, like a lot of people will be putting up these types of acoustic treatments into uh, places where they need to be able to take it down again and move. Um, and they'll be putting it up in places where they can't permanently attach things to the wall. A lot of people that, uh, a lot of music producers are, are renting. Well, you know, that's one of the big frustrations we had with, um, with foam is that we would ship every bundle of foam out with, you know, construction glue. And that, you know, oh, sure, it goes up great. You glue it up on the wall. What we found out is it costs more to fix the wall than buying the product in the first place. Because someone's got to now re, you know, re-sand down all the walls. You've got to have a drywaller in to clean it all up because you're going to pay for it one way or another. Your landlord's not going to accept it. So we have these impalers um, that are really, really easy to do. They're, they're little kind of like spikes that stick out like that. So you have a couple of screws, just as if you were hanging up a picture window. Uh, so a picture in your, your, your house, you can just hang uh, the panel like that. And boy, I'll tell you, it solves all those problems. A little yeah. putty when you're ready to leave, touch up paint, you're done. You haven't got any big cleanup costs. And that's a major concern that people, again, didn't know about in the 80s or 90s because it was oh, we were all using foam. And then all of a sudden, these problems started to occur. And that's how part of the other reason why we changed over to a, a different format is the mounting. Well, that's the main reason why I haven't done any acoustic treatment in my studio whatsoever, mainly because I move a lot. And even when I owned and had my own condo, I was going to renovate it. And I didn't want to put something up that an eventual purchaser would um, would frown on or, or would cost me money later on. So again, this is one of the reasons why I came to talk to you guys because you stood out amongst the other companies and you'd thought of these problems ahead of time and you had a solution for it. We, we actually even take it to the next level now. We're about to launch, or actually by the time you guys view this video, we'll have launched a new product called the Paintables. 
and that allows you to actually put a panel on the wall and paint it the same color as your wall or else you can actually transfer images over to it so you can put your favorite you know album covers or your kids pictures or whatever you want uh, you know your whatever on your wall so and the idea behind the paintables is exactly taking that step one one further we call it the uh, the wife factor or the girlfriend factor <laughs> where they look at these panels they say look uh, bob you can't put those up on the wall because i'll kill you what we wanted to do was make a panel that that they would actually like because it can look like art or else it'll just completely um you know seamlessly go in with the paint so that's the paintables and that's a brand new series uh, they're actually being acoustically tested at riverbank labs as we speak and then going to fire tests over here uh in in vancouver to the fire test facility because the, you know again we're very concerned about making sure our products meet the requirements yeah fantastic well it sounds like a great way actually to uh to get the money from uh, from the wife, hey, if it were, I'm going to get some pictures of our kids put up in the studio, and you know, or you have a girlfriend, you get her photo, maybe 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 a little Valentine's Day photo underneath the panel. She doesn't need to know. We we went online and just <laughs> pulled some uh, images of guitars for for a recent trade show, and they look killer. I mean, you know, if you're a musician, you love guitars, so you put up a Strat, a Les Paul, a Paul Reed Smith, an old three three five. Great pictures for the studio. They look very musical. No one has to know other than you that they're acoustic panels. They look great. Yeah, they cost a little bit more money that way, but boy, you know what a statement. Really neat.